yeah, I, I, I just like working with that kind of character, just to see. Those can be fun to Yeah, just to see what I can throw at them and what other authors will throw at them and to see how that character will react, like whether with anger, exasperation. Uh, I think there's one that leaves me up. Or I'm going to get through this, just whatever. It's one of the things I like about that one is where there's a lead in through that, that you have a character that is abused throughout the fic that always just, oftentimes you see it in terms of every time they try and say something important, they get cut off by a more important character and they just keep, you know, playing the, the doormat. And one of the things that always is sort of a feel good thing that comes out of that, and it's sort of comedic usually when it's done, is at the end, they get their comeuppance. They get to be able to say, I told you so, or why didn't you listen to me, or that reversal of fortune somewhere later on the line, whoever was the doormat gets to prove that they were right or save the day or something like that. And usually it's to great comedic effect when it's done right. Uh, we get a question back? That's just a, a reference from the show specifically during Magic Duel, Fluttershy is trying to point out, I found it, and then everyone else just talking over her. Yes, that is, yeah, that's a great mm -hmm. example of that, yeah. What about you, Marie Marksman? Uh, I you got to be a, sorry to be a let down. I'm uh, not really big on uh, tropes and stuff. Fair enough. Uh, yeah. Okay, fair enough. Uh, yeah. No well, all I was going to say is I think another term for that uh, sort of character is generally the fall guy. With yeah, the, that the too. situation is a more classic. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And very, yeah, a lot of those things are very related and stuff too, and there's yeah a lot of things similar to that and stuff. Um, I'm not sure if this is a trope, but this is one technique used in comedy. This is one of the most reliable ways. Like you see it over and over again, and once you know it exists, you'll see it all the time in pretty much everything. It's the rule of three. Something happens, the same thing happens again, and as humans, we are instinctively trained to believe it'll happen the third time, and then something completely different. Usually, the opposite happens the third time, and it's random slash unexpected, and that is hilarious if you do it properly. And it's like the odd couple. It's something you can just do over and over and over again, and it's just going to work. Yeah, um, there's a lot of good things like that. And a lot of those devices that you're talking about, I think, is more of a device than possibly a trope. There's things like that. It goes in the same category as things like the callback, where the stuff is referenced uh, early on in the show or a script or an episode. You see this a lot with sitcoms. And then you'll start to forget about it. They'll go through the later half of the episode. And then at the very end, there'll be this callback to that and they'll reference that thing at the very end of it, usually to good comedic effect. A lot of stand-up comedians will use something like that too. There's a whole plethora of comedic devices that tend to work and are just known to work. And learning what those are, reading and researching that can certainly help you, but I said, start to identify some of those things like that. One of the things I've always found very needed for, to me, good comedy is you can write those and you just write them just right out in front of someone they're not as funny as if they're integrated, if they're integrated with the story and woven in there in what feels like a natural way. I always like relatively natural comedy that feels like, oh, the characters would actually right. say this to one another. They would actually make these jokes themselves. It is a lot funnier when I think that it's in character and fits in the story. So on that idea, do you guys have any tips and suggestions for how do you try and make your comedy integral to the story without making it just sort of stand out like a sore thumb? Do you have any tips for trying to do that? I don't try and make my stories like that's the thing. I don't actually just set out to try and make it funny. I'm like, yeah, this is going to be a comedy, but I just sort of let the characters in the situation sort of create the comedy organically. Uh, one example is I wrote a story called Be Like Her. It's about Scootaloo, and um, Scootaloo's getting sick, and she like keeps she wants to keep training and fighting through it because there's like a tournament she wants to play in, and um, you know, Sweetie Belle and Apple Bloom like, no, take a rest, take a rest, and then. Sweetie Belle's like, oh, uh, maybe you should drink, some, or maybe you should have some oranges. They have a lot of vitamin C. And then I just randomly thought of this idea, and Apple Bloom just sort of grabs Sweetie Belle like this and says, "Don't you be talking about consumption of them oranges around these parts." And like a really <laughs> threatening voice. I didn't even, I didn't go. I want to be funny here. It just sort of said, "This might work." And then I wrote it, and it actually worked on paper, and that was funny. And it wasn't even meant to be a comedy fic. It just had comedy naturally. Yeah, when the characters tell you that they, they're ready to make a joke, that's when you know you're doing it right. Because if you try hard, try too hard, pretty much anything, and this is like a general rule in writing, if you try too hard to do something, you will most likely fail just as hard as you try. It has to be natural. Um, yeah, sure. You made the point that you weren't writing a comedy. Now, I write a lot of uh, 
um, grim stories, mm -hmm. and I find comedy is utterly essential. It is. You have even more so than in a, in a comedy story because it keeps yep. the read, it gives the reader a little relief. That and if you want a really sad moment, you need something to contrast it. So you want a really extreme high and then a really extreme low. And that low is going to hit a lot harder because it, it's just the contrast created. But because if you're in just grim, dark, grim, dark, grim, dark, it's just going to sort of get dull over time and there's nothing to relieve it. So, yes, comedy is very essential. So, back to the, the tropes and devices question. So, you guys are, so I'm assuming that, and correct me if I'm wrong, but that, that the same people do not write every single episode because you never get anything done. Mm -hmm. So then how, so if, if somebody chooses to use <coughs> something and then the other team chooses to use it and it's gonna show up, when, when, is it, when does somebody notice that, wait, we're doing the exact same thing in episode three and episode four because we had odd team and even team? How just just, to, just to be clear, that. That. I was doing yeah. I was just gonna, just to be clear though, we're not associated with the show. We are all fan fiction writers here. So oh, we don't actually work on the show. Yeah, right. But I can, he does have some insight. I can not write it. I've, I'm a writing major and I've studied screenwriting. And okay. uh, what happens is with seasons, they basically do uh, a pitch where they basically spend a whole, all the writers gather in a room and they spend all day just pitching episode ideas and then the episodes get assigned to the writers. So like M.A. Larson writes these three episodes and Megan McCarthy writes these five. And the outline is basically all there, or at least the like one or two paragraph pitch is all there, and the whole season is planned out on that day. And when you draft the episode, which takes about a week, you submit it to the director and they give you notes back. So the director will see all of it laid out in front of them and say, oh no, you can't do this, someone's doing that. Then they send it to the network, get notes back, and then they revise it again, send it to the director, and then there you go. Cool. Something like that. Right. It's like the writer's room thing yeah. for screenwriting. Um, either of you have any, uh, how you try and integrate uh, comedy in some sort of natural way and stuff? Do you think about it much, or do you do like two um, just let it happen? You know, sometimes you just set out to write a comedy fic, knowing from the very first moment that it'll be funny, or hoping from the very first moment that it'll be funny. Uh, you know, I've written stuff like Princess Celestia gets mugged, where she goes out and disguises herself as a pegasus and then gets mugged and they kidnap her for ransom when they see how much money she has on her. And, you know, you got fun characters to work with, like the inept kidnappers who <laughs> hope to deliver the ransom note to the palace right to Princess Luna. That works well. <laughs> And when they're all playing poker and Princess Celestia wins back all the money that they stole from her, that kind of thing. Um, so, you know, sometimes just, I mean, it's not like the most highbrow of comedy, um, but, you know, it's, it's silly fun. And that's totally fine to write sometimes, just silly fun. Um, but I also agree, uh, these two, that um, in darker situations, uh, comedy is absolutely essential for reading this like lighter situations. It's just I think that's totally necessary because um, otherwise it's just going to be boom, 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 boom to the readers, and then you're like, okay, this is getting a bit too much. I need to turn off the browser for a little while and go walk around my house, take a few deep breaths, dunk my head in the pool, and then maybe come back to it. So, for example, one of my stories, TV the Alicorn Princess, um, for the past 50,000 words or so, there's been a looming threat of essentially pony World War I. Um, but I take a break a little bit for his birthday, and they all go to Las Pegasus and just have a grand old time. It's, it's a fun little chapter, and it's a nice relief from the stress of everything that's happening. Yeah, I think it's important not just in grimdark, but in a lot of any longer fic. Comedy is relief valve for all, all the emotions that get built up and sort of lets you, it's a palate cleanser in a lot of ways for any sort of story of any good length. So, uh, question? Um, when you have, uh, when you are using comedy as a contrast and you do it as a whole chapter, do you ever uh, find it kind of derails and it's kind of hard to get back on the main story train? And like, how do you keep from going from, well, this chapter is going to be more lighthearted, it's comedy, to, 
you know, we need to get back on to, you know, there's a looming threat of world war or something like that without it being too sharp of a contrast? Uh, it's best if you always have it kind of like in the background, like waiting in the wings as opposed to forgetting about it completely. So like, for example, in his birthday chapter, I you know, he meets with a bunch of nobles and I set up something that's going to happen in a later chapter. So flows quite nicely. One of the nobles comes up and says, can I meet with you? So he's like, yeah. So the other will ask that. They have a birthday chapter, and the very next chapter is, can I meet with you? So flows rather nice. So that kind of thing. If you set up a little something before the lighthearted chapter, it just kind of flows right into the next chapter. I find that there's a lot of times a natural cadence in a longer story, too. Um, not every chapter is the denouement. There's not always some big rising action scene. So a lot of times you'll be coming off a plot that's sort of doing this through a longer story, and you come off a big action scene or something really important or stressful or you know a lot of plot-related stuff, and it's naturally going to drop back down to a more idle period while you get ready to set up the next stage of the story. In there is often a good time to put comedy on it and stuff because while you're setting up the next big thing that's going to be you know, the important quest or whatever, you can have that time while you're doing the setup to get comedy in there as well because the stakes aren't that high yet again before they start going back up. So I think you can find natural spots to, even a full chapter can a lot of times be fit in there and make the setup. I think. Part of that just goes down to outlining. I mean, I like, I'm kind of like a guy who likes to have milestones in his story and then I sort of just see to my pants go from milestone to milestone and I'm willing to deviate if uh, necessary. So if you kind of know what your next step is, you can kind of work toward that and sort of transition that way, I guess. Um, I'd uh, have to say, just don't try too hard if you're gonna you know, have an entire thing dedicated to you know, being lighthearted and stuff. Personally, I'd uh, go to a darker story. I just have a you know, comedy relief throughout the entire story, so that entire chapter that I gave you, I'd to avoid derailing it. It's going to fall to wall like that would just uh, probably really set up, you know, mess up the mood and all. Is there any way you could um, uh, make an ironic situation be funny? Funny? I was going to say, I, mean, I think I, I'm running some irony. Yeah. 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 I mean, that is one of the, the comedy principles. Irony is often used to comedic effect quite often. So, ironic situations. Usually it's the reveal of the irony that's where the comedy source comes from, that you set up a situation such that it's going to be ironic, and if you've done it in a slightly subtle way that the reader doesn't quite make the connection yet, or maybe the characters haven't, that realization when they realize how ridiculous or ironic the situation they're in is, that's where the comedy comes in, so that reveal point. Then of course there's the whole dramatic irony thing where the reader's like, uh oh, this is gonna happen, this is gonna happen. The characters are just walking right into it, and you're just like, oh no. And it it's it can be pretty funny. If it's a funny situation, if it's a yeah. tragically <laughs> ironic <laughs> thing, maybe people aren't gonna be laughing when people walk into a trap for your characters uh, yeah. or going to their doom. But maybe they're not. Maybe. It depends on the character and it depends on the doom. I mean, you know. <laughs> Death by banana cream pot might be something that's going somewhere. We have a question way in the back. Yeah. Sure. How do you <laughs> keep things light and humorous enough, even, or what are some methods you can use even when things get heavy in a longer story? Let me give an example. A while back, Anonymous uh, wrote a very funny story, which I was briefly reading for, about Chrysalis's daughter hating Chrysalis, running away and trying to find her father, shining arm. But when he got the part about like learning about what Chrysalis did to Shining Armor, he throws up and actually deletes the story because it's like, I can't make this funny, this this serious stuff. What are some things you can do to keep a longer funny story funny when it gets serious? It's that a huge happens. fallacy that funny stories can never be serious. You look at like Comedies like Shaun of the Dead and Hot Fuzz. Some of the funniest movies ever made, they can be pretty serious. Mm -hmm. Like, you're, you're laughing at, you know, them doing the zombie walk one minute, and then you realize, oh my gosh, Shaun's mother is bitten the next minute, and you're like, oh, wow. 
this is, that's not funny. So it's a huge fallacy that comedies can never be funny. In trying to keep them lighthearted, I would say one of the things that people in real life, when they're in a stressful situation, will often use comedy or laughter and stuff like that to try and deal with stress in hard situations. Uh, a common form that takes is sarcasm. A lot of characters reacting to a situation that's tough, like, oh no, we're all gonna die now. When characters are actually just start getting sarcastic about their situation, when they've been, you know, when the world has hit them from all angles and everything is just going to, they can be sarcastic. And if it's natural for your characters to have some of that sarcasm, sarcasm can be witty comments. I mean, it's not quite the same lighthearted funniness sometimes, but saying witty, clever insults even. There can be funny, you know, things that are just, there can be funny curses. And whether, you know, you're making a, you know, a pseudo curse of, you know, <coughs> oh, by Thor's hammer or something, you know, or what was that in uh, Galaxy was, by grab Thor's hammer. It was funny even though they were using it in place of where a curse would be or something. So, you can, it's sarcasm and how characters, you know, think of your characters as people and how real people would deflect stressful situations in comedy. I also have another point to make that uh, comedy for the longest time has been, you can actually convey a lot of serious messages through comedy because we're laughing and it kind of disarms us and we can actually be hit with the seriousness of the message. And this really dates back to the old, uh, the old days, medieval times, where the only person who could tell the king he was an idiot was the court jester because it's just comedy, but if the court jester was witty enough, then he could say, king, you're stupid, you did X, Y, and Z, and then the king's like, Oh yeah, maybe I shouldn't do that. And you can actually convey a lot of serious stuff through comedy, so just remember that. It, it, it takes a lot of wit to write comedy, though. It's a lot harder than it seems. Okay. Yes, All right. Uh, uh, did you raise your hand again? Yeah, for another question. Why not? Go for it. What are some of your favorite comedies by other authors and why? What makes them work? Let's take that one at a time, and uh, one, or you need to list a couple, but if you're going to talk in detail, pick one that you like the best. Start, start from the other, and then whoever wants to go first. Um, I'm just like I have enough. <laughs> oh, uh, I have my answer. Yeah, go for it. If you're, if you're uh, it's, it's a story by Colin Yardes about a called Naked Singularity, where Twilight. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody who's read it knows why. It's so <laughs> uncomfortable, but it is so funny. We're try Twilight's trying to write romance novels, and they are so bad. <laughs> <laughs> and she, she thinks they're masterpieces, and she, she gives them to Rarity, like, because Rarity uh, and Fluttershy, they're like romance novels. Uh, one of the lines is, romance novels are like a sixth food group for Fluttershy. So she gives romance novels to Rarity, and is like, here, read this. I've been writing this. Mary's like, oh, wow, you've been writing this. Amazing. And she reads it and she's like, oh my gosh. <laughs> so she gives it to Flutter. So she gives it to Flutter for the child. The very next line is, this is terrible. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> don't, don't be sorry, Flutter I know this is awful. And so it changes. So they go and tell. So, so Rarity forces <coughs> Flutter to go tell Twilight. You, this needs some work. <laughs> so Fluttershy says, okay, this needs some work, but put more of yourself into it. Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> put more of what makes you special into it. So she shoves science into it. She pulls astronomy books off the shelf, physics books, so it's romance with just tons of like technical science terms, and then she gives it to Rarity, who splits it between her Rainbow Dash, and it's all self-insert, so there's, <laughs> so the character, main character is Evening Glimmer, and she has, uh, one of her lovers is uh, uh, Elusive, and uh, Prism Slash. <laughs> And, and Rainbow Dash reads Prism Slash, who's a Cyan Pegasus, and she's like, oh, this is a really cool character, fastest Pegasus, yeah, this is cool. And Rarity's like, you, you don't get that? <laughs> no, but this character sounds cool. <laughs> <laughs> she's like, oh, dang it. <laughs> it's a male character, and it's like, oh. 
And, I and, know maybe not the brightest crayon in the box. No, <laughs> which is ironic hey. considering, <laughs> considering <laughs> Maine. So, so, so uh, they're all reading it, and Flutter and Rainbow Dash loves it. And Fluttershy and Rarity are like, okay, this is awful. So they go to uh, Twilight's treehouse to see, okay, to tell Twilight, okay, we need to encourage her to write other things. <laughs> Only to find that Twilight has gone to a literature recital in Canterlot <laughs> with a chapter of her masterpiece, a rather steamy chapter. So, and, yeah, and, and everybody shows up. Princess Celestia shows up. Her parents show up. Cheerily with a bunch of school holes. <laughs> and it just keeps getting worse. <laughs> so it's a race to see if they can stop Twilight. And in the, in the description, it, it says, can they stop Twilight before she embarrasses everybody? In the description, it says, no, they cannot. <laughs> <laughs> And comedies are one of the ones that can get away with that sort of story that they can tell you up front, oh yeah, no, this is exactly what's going to happen, and you're going to read it anyway because the comedy is great. If someone told you how Lord of the Rings was going to end, you'd be a lot less interested in watching it. If someone told you how a lot of traditional stories were going to end, we call that spoilers. For comedy, you can start off with that, and then in many ways it's liberating when you're writing comedy to be able to do that because now you don't have to pretend that it's a regular story. You know you're focused on the comedy, and you don't have to try and keep anything secret. You don't have to think about being subtle. You can focus just on trying to make the reader laugh. And so I think that's a great example of that. Uh, you guys got a ten of your favorites? Um, I don't remember the name of it. It's a fic I read like a month or two back about Twilight going mad of power after the season four finale. And she decides that the best way to take care of a question's problems is to just destroy everything. <laughs> so she just so she takes out Tyrek. That she goes off and takes out a uh, what's the place uh, prison? Tartarus. Oh, Tartarus. That's it. She goes there, blows that place up like a, a nuke or something like that. <laughs> And then uh, <laughs> wipes out basically all the evil that she think that had appeared in the show that hasn't been reformed. And she decides, wait a second, what if uh, Luna becomes a nightmare and the moon again? Or if uh, <laughs> Discord decides to turn on us again? So she goes and imprisons Luna, says uh, that the game makes her like count down to like a million or something like that to keep her distracted. Then goes and uh, knocks out. Uh, this in prison and uh, throws her in prison. Her, throws him in prison with uh, Luna. And uh, after they're in prison, uh, <coughs> Celestia figures out. And I think she like she just goes in there. She's just yelling and uh, yeah, kind of resolves herself basically. Kind of stuff and explaining it. I, I didn't read it. It's been a while since I read it. Here. So I'm kind of a major fail in this part because um, I actually don't have that many fa like I actually was like what fa what comedies do I really like and I looked through my really small favorites list and I found like only one or two comedies. Um, the one I found was Marital Bliss by Skywriter and that was like the I, I think that was when Shining Armor was um, like he was in training and he was like taught taught like how to throw your wife. Mm. <laughs> 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 you may need to use this someday. <laughs> may come in handy. It's the white wing screen. Yeah, the white wing screen. Yeah, that one. That was pretty good. My wife. There are many like. It'll take you about five minutes. <laughs> it's a ten minute read. Just go look up Marital Bliss by Skywriter. Just go look up Skywriter and read everything he did because Skywriter, Skywriter is one of the <laughs> actual like, legit author authors of the fandom. Like he's like actually a professional writer, and he really knows what he's doing. Yeah, he is the real deal for sure. Larry. Another fic of his I recommend, even though it's not comedy, is uh, Sun Princess. Mm. That, yeah, yeah, he does some sad fics too. That is good. Skyrider, uh, you might know him. He writes the webcomic Skin Mars. Yes. yes. <laughs> Jeffrey, uh, Jeffrey C. Wells is the name that he uses out of the webcomic. For myself, it was 
there's sort of a toss up. The other one is the Skyrider one, so I'll jump to the other one. Uh, Skyrider one called Princess Celestia Hates Teen. Oh, yeah. Uh, it is basically, it is one of the more popular stories on the site, so a lot of you may have read it already. But Princess Celestia Hates Tea. And it basically leads to an international incident, nearly, because Twilight does not believe that her mentor could possibly hate tea after loving for so long, so she must be a changeling. And Twilight <laughs> overreacts in the way only Twilight can. The castle gets half blown up, the guard gets called in, they start trying to arrest Celestia, and yeah, all because she said she really did not like the taste of, you know, leaves boiled in water. And it is a very funny one. But not to use a Skywriter example, another one that I read well over a year ago, probably even farther back than that. Unfortunately, it's unfinished, but it's called Top Gear, The Worst Diplomats in the World, and is a crossover with the British car show Top Gear, <laughs> which is a funny show in its own right, and if any of you have watched that, you might be familiar with that and know that. Seeing that crossed over with Pony, just, it's a, it is by the book, fish out of water sort of story. The, the, in Top Gear, these guys that review cars are basically sent on quests or missions by uh, their producers to go around the world, do things supposedly car related. Most of the time they end up getting like attacked by crocodiles. <laughs> they end up in Equestria through the magic portal, of course, and they're having to deal with all this stuff and the way they react is so spot on for how like, the actual uh, people from the TV show do. And he did a good job characterizing the companies as well. <coughs> the interaction the crossover between those two when yeah, they start trying to figure out how to enchant their cars to like do racing circuits up the clouds, they own stuff. Uh, there's some slightly inappropriate scenes where they sell certain things found in a glove box as uh, strawberry flavored balloons. Uh, 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 there is a lot of, there's a lot of humor in it and stuff. Unfortunately, I think it sort of got dropped, but it was by uh, Blues Tunes. I had to look it up. Blue Tunes was the uh, author of that one. But that sort of crossover was a fish out of water, and it was fanfic of two different things, which was a very interesting mix to me for, for a comedy. So. Well, do we want to talk about some of the comedies we wrote? Uh, yeah. What? Well, you know what? Let you guys do that. Yeah. What? Your favorite comedy, and what was your thought with Brian? Uh, let's see. Um, the one I referenced earlier, Be Like Her, is not a comedy, even though it has funny moments in it. But the comedy I'm most proud of because it actually hurt my brain physically to do this is a crossover between Tommy Wiseau's The Room and My Little Pony. It's oh, called The Barn. The room. Oh, yeah, it's oh. called The Barn. And Shining Armor is Tommy Wiseau. And <laughs> Twilight Sparkle's Denny. Big Mac is Mark. Cadence is Lisa, obviously. <laughs> and uh, yeah, basically what happens is it's like an alternate reality of Twilight couldn't defeat um, Sombra in the Crystal Empire, so Cadence and Shining Armor are now like jobless in disgrace, so they end up living in um, Applejack's barn and Shining Armor, you know, he obviously works at a bank and has like a tux and all that stuff. Um, I just sort of like, okay, all this sort of, yeah, hoofball, <laughs> let's toss the hoofball around. And um, I was like, it's, it kind of runs like the room, but since there's so much stupid stuff in the room that doesn't make sense, I either let the characters sort of have their own influence on how the room scenes play out, or they just question the stupidity of it as it happens. Like the flower shop scene, for instance. If you, if you know that, they just sort of deconstruct it a little bit. And just kind of fusing it together, and it, it still runs like the movie. If you've seen The Room, the film, you know exactly what's going to happen in the barn for the most part, but it, it changes enough and it's a bit self-aware. It's just really stupid, and if, if it hurts your brain reading it, I'm sorry, but I suffered a lot more writing it because I had to study The Room <laughs> so hard. Like, I watched that film like six times in a day because I was like, you know, this is what happens. And I like record timelines, and this scene happens, this scene happens, and I ended up having to omit half the movie because it just sort of repeats itself after an hour. We're, we're not joking when we said writing good comedy takes hard work, and when you find it, yeah, there's no one that you go into it sometimes. Bernie Wright? <laughs> like this day is going to be perfect. It's pretty dumb.
with all the quiet dignity and grace that I can muster, I walk up to Celestia and punch her in the face. <laughs> yeah. But those only start out as comedies. Every single one of them starts out as a comedy, and then they just go almost completely serious. So, yeah, I guess I have to say Celestia gets mugged. Uh, because I think that's the only one that I've written that's like maintains comedy throughout. Maintains yeah. comedy throughout, and is like actually good comedy. I mean, it's, yeah, it's silly comedy. Um, yeah, she wins. Comedy can be silly a lot. That's yeah, good. I mean, and there's nothing wrong with like silly comedy as long as it doesn't dissolve into. I don't know what I'm doing, so I'm just throwing jokes at the screen, hoping something will stick and some, somebody will go. <laughs> yeah, with, I think there's a, there is definitely a there's a whole class of supposedly comedy writing, and there's a fine line between comedy fic and what I think a lot of people call random fic, where it tends to be just a lot of random happenings. Usually, the author seems to be trying to achieve some comedic effect, but it's very disjointed and stuff, whereas... I don't mean to despair to people that like that style of uh, random fic or practical, as some people call it. But at the same time, it doesn't work for everyone. And oh, you know, a lot of times, comedy, if you're sitting there and planning it out, you can certainly take that practical approach and, like you said, throw a thousand jokes against the screen and see what sticks. But trying to write a comedy that actually still involves some sort of story like your story you're describing, there's still a plot arc to it, even though it's not necessarily a serious one or a deep one. There's still a plot that the comedy is built on top of. Uh, if you're losing that, you're just telling jokes. You should be doing stand-up routine probably instead of you know maybe trying to write a story. Uh, Marine Marksman, you got to um, adding on to your uh, last statement. Mm -hmm. I have to say that uh, crack fix and stuff is actually a pretty good way to start out. You know, when you're just trying to scan the huge economy and stuff. Mm -hmm. because yeah, yeah, it certainly is just a, a, a different type of thing. There's, you know, a, a, a plot art based comedy, and then there is the more craft fic, random fic, yeah. where you can just write a lot of stuff. And, and that's more about scenes almost a lot of times. What would you say the definition of a crack fit, crack fic is? <sighs> trying too hard. <laughs> <laughs> trying too hard without a plan, I think. You can try really hard to write Lord of the Rings, because I think you would have to if you were going to write something epic like that. But you're trying too hard without any plan or target or goal, I think. You're just, it, it's, it's a quintessential example of off-the-cuff writing, but without the coherency that sometimes, so, a lot of people can write you know, by the seat of their pants and still get through a coherent arc. It's when you're just having scattered stuff. And some people, like I said, enjoy those and read those and stuff. So I don't mean to disparage them particularly, but it's certainly a different style of comedy or in writing in general than uh, you know, art-based comedy. So, it's you know. based Go ahead. Yeah. yeah. Um, basically, in my opinion, uh, crack fics are a. Uh, it's really a lot of what I was going to say. Yeah, never mind. Are you encouraging the writing of crack fics? Yes, I am. <laughs> 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 um, <laughs> all right. <laughs> <laughs> um, and that's the comedic exit, ladies and gentlemen. Yeah. <laughs> um, as a pre reader for the Royal Guard, one thing we automatically reject fix for is called an excuse plot, where the fic relies on a punchline. And um, one fic is, that is a good example of that is called Every Pony Dies. I'm not sure if you've ever heard of it. Um, Every Pony, basically, what happens it's like Rarity wants to do a dying competition, like DYE, and then Pinky oh. misspells it. And there's that dramatic <laughs> irony there, but. It's just repeated over and over again, and it's not funny because nothing really new is added to it. And then when they finally, everyone believes her, they think it's going to be the end of the world because Pinky's like, yeah, my Pinky senses everyone's going to die. And then it gets cleared up after there's like a giant riot in front of Rarity's boutique, and they start doing the competition. And then the moon lands on them, and apparently it was all a dream, and Princess Luna, it was like they all had the same dream, like all of Ponyville did, and Princess Luna trolled them by dropping the moon on them. And that's like kind of like a crack fix. <coughs> And that's like an excuse plot. The punchline isn't even that funny, but uh, that, that's an idea of it, I guess. Yeah, that it's when, when you start plot. doing, and you just start doing the random stuff at the end where there's just a bunch of surprises, surprises, and not plot-based surprises that had been set up, like you said, just, yeah. oh, it's a dream, oh, this happened, now this happened, and now all of a sudden, like, uh, train comes crashing through, you know, the 
exactly. train comes crashing through the bedroom of the trope. Is it uh, We had, yeah, I've seen several hands up. I'm trying to remember. Uh, let's go front. We'll go front to back. There's a white shirt there in the front. Uh, mm -hmm. Yes, you. Yeah. Right. Um, so a few uh, questions ago, you mentioned some films like Hot Fuzz and Shaun of the Dead. Yeah. One of my you know, movies that's made me laugh the most is called In Bruges. Oh, at the end of that film, like every everyone is dying, either killed themselves or you know been killed. Um, it, but it's hilarious, and we haven't really talked too much about dark comedies or black comedies, as they're called. Um, I, I'd like to know, like, you know, we 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 mentioned how you can use comedy to help make a serious point, but what techniques or tropes or, or ideas do you use to make something that? You know, terrible situations funny instead of terrible situations sad. How do you tonally make that so the reader, uh, like, do you try to prevent empathy with the characters so that they don't feel sad with them? Do you distance them different ways? Is it not about distancing? Like, what do you use in order to make sad stuff funny instead of sad to create a good dark comedy? Or, sorry, go ahead. I think it's all about the characters and how they react to the situation. Um, and you know, there are still like, you know, comedy tropes in, like like the stuff we've been discussing in In Bruges when he's like yelling at the guy he thinks is an American uh, for like an American killing John Lennon. Then he gets arrested on the train later. He's like, you hit the Canadian. It's like, it's, it's hilarious because it's like, he's Canadian. Or the guy he's calling fat, like, you need to work out. And then later it's like, the tower's closed because the fat guy had a heart attack. It's like, okay, that's, that's hilarious. It's this, because there's the setups and punchlines. So, and then there's also, you know, there's towing the line between the characters taking the situation seriously and the characters, like, I don't want to say, like, not taking them seriously, but the way they react to them is, like, humorous. We look at, how they react to them and go, okay, that's actually kind of funny. Um, I think part of that comes into being, with the, with the characterization terms, it's a lot easier to do a black comedy when the characters are sort of resigned to the fate, when the characters are no longer as fearful of whatever the, the darkness is, the, whatever the bad thing is that's happening. There's, uh, in that, it's that the guy knows he's done something bad and he's coming to terms with it. And so the comedy can happen because He's sort of numb to the actual like horror, bad stuff hanging around him. Once the characters get a little numb, black comedy can happen because we're in the audience. And I'm not sure we should laugh at this, but the characters are laughing at it, so it's okay that they're doing that sort of maybe sometimes maniac, not quite maniac, but just sort of numb way. So if your characters get numb to stuff, right. I think I have a good example also to follow this up. Uh, are you guys familiar with The Wicker Man? <laughs> the Nicolas Cage Wicker Man? Yes. Oh, we'll not, we'll not, no, no, so we ever discuss that. As a fan of the original, <laughs> I forbid you. <laughs> That's a good thing. So black comedy. It's, it's, it's um like it's, it's a really a tragic. tragic right? It's it's a you know it's a horror film no. and it's meant and there's a lot of tragic stuff that happens. No. I mean, Nick Cage gets burned alive, but it's That's hilarious. Tragic. Because <laughs> well, you know what I mean. Like there's like sacrifices and. You know, guy burning inside a giant wicker man, and but it's bees. hilarious because of the bees. Yeah, the bees, and <laughs> it's, just study that film, and that's one way to make you know, serious situations just off the wall funny, melt your brain. So, I have a question over here too. Well, no, another great example of that is Buffy the Vampire Slayer. As the seasons go on, on like, it's the end of the world again. I'll get the kid. Yeah, that I think Buffy took a slightly higher note than a true black comedy. It was a little more. It was a little. You didn't. You weren't. It was a more of an adventure thing. You weren't ever worried that the characters themselves were horribly, horribly in trouble all the time. I mean, they were in dangerous situations, but like adventure stuff was. Um, sorry, we had to go like back. So like oh, the guy back there was gonna. So I actually so I wanted to be a plus one on your crap fit comment because you know everybody that's in this room didn't we're all here because we have some sort of feral creative urge that we're trying to scratch and to suck some skills out of the people in the front of the room <laughs> that actually made it to the front of the room. And and the deal ends up being is that if you don't write something, you never write something. 
Yep. And it's exactly. very unlikely that the something that you wrote isn't going to suck. So you pretty much got to get out there and start sucking because after you write something that most of it sucks, you'll be able to go back and look and say, okay, out of my 1900 paragraphs, hey, there's three here that don't suck. Okay, <laughs> now I only got to get another 1897. And so, so really, it's an iterative process, and that's why there's editors, and that's why Rarity showed, or excuse me, Twilight Sparkle showed her stuff to her friends, and her friends were too chicken to share that, hey, dude, this is crap. Certainly, writers write as the saying goes, and if you're, even if you write bad stuff, writing is still better than not writing, you're trying to get better at it. Because if you write, it doesn't matter what you're writing, if you write, you will get better at writing. There's just, there's no doubt about it. There's keep writing no matter what it is, and as long as you're willing to accept the criticism and know that not everything is gonna be gold, just keep writing. And crap fix, if that's the way it gets out of your system, great, you will get improved as a writer and you will learn more no matter what you write. Um, we have one in the back there, uh, he had his hand up a while ago, so yeah, crap. Uh, <laughs> just uh, further on the, the black comedy front, uh, on one that uh, pony fic that demonstrates the, uh, the one where the, where the characters are numb to it, and that's what allows it to be funny. Uh, there's a story called Banishment Decree. Mm -hmm. uh, it's it's uh, kind of based off of Burn Notice. <laughs> and it starts it stars, uh, Gilda and Trixie. So uh, it's, it's wrong and gory and really funny, uh, but that's, that's the source of the comedy in that one is the fact that um, Trixie and Gilda are completely blase about the horrible things that happen to them and around them. Um, so. Yeah, really good one to check out. Uh, let's go straight to the back there, Pink Tie. Russ, I knew what he had to say. I feel like, is it is that free writing? That's the word here? Mm -hmm. could, could be, yeah. Mm -hmm. I, what you're saying is like a matter of experimenting. Oh, if that was bad, then that was bad. We learn from our mistakes, and if you want to grow as a writer, you should always try and push yourself out of your comfort zone, and try and improve what you suck at the most, and just try new things, and you'll just get better by doing that, by learning from your mistakes. Yeah, you're allowed, you are allowed to fail as a writer. You are allowed to fail. No, you're actually required stuff. to fail a lot before you yeah. I mean, It will happen. It's inevitable. So half of the stuff I've written, I admit readily, is garbage. <laughs> My only good story prior to probably the original non brony story is The Secret Life of Fairy. Everything else is... Let's not talk about it. <laughs> <laughs> Every bird I've written is good. No. No. Question here in the front. Uh, I was just wondering, you said that you like, have a character not like reacting anymore, not black, that they're not scared of their shit anymore, so what separates like black comedy if they're not scared of it and like I'm having a BA moment walking into the danger. There's a, sort of the I think the difference is the difference between adventure or comedy and tragedy. And I mean that in sort of the more brief sense of those words. Mm -hmm. um, when you know when the characters like a hero and going in to fight the bad guys in a G.I. Joe movie that you're not, it's, they're, if they're not scared, that's not, that's not because they're resigned to their fate. They don't know for sure that it's going to end badly. They're the hero and it's a heroic thing they're doing. It's a, it's a slightly different attitude than in a black comedy or something else where you know this is going to end badly. You know that this is not a good outcome. At least even a hero going to maybe potentially die and like fighting the bad guys, at least is still doing something in a noble cause. Whereas in a black comedy, it's often for a pointless reason, something bad is gonna happen just because that's fate, that's life, they have cancer, whatever it is. And once they've become numb to that, or at least resigned to their fate, then they tend to be a character that's more open to comedic stuff, I think. I think that's the thing. Uh, next question. Uh, let's go there with the green. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, that's, yes, you said it. Okay. Just saying, sure. um, some of the uh, really dark comedies that I've uh, had the pleasure of reading on Thin Thick dealt a lot in absurdity with uh, how they how they deliver the, the, the violence or the death and that sort of thing. It's not necessarily that people are acclimated to it, it's just so over the top and bizarre. It's like, how, how in the world does it even get started? Um, 
Excessive, but, maybe. Ex ex so excessive true. absurdity. Yeah. I mean, for instance, uh, Rainbow Namakon. <laughs> Rainbow <laughs> crashes into a mountain and doesn't make it. Incidentally, Twilight's been studying a new book and comes up with a narrator to bring her back to life. Right. Unfortunately, right. when she gets up, she's hungry. <laughs> 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 and then Twilight has to figure out how to fix it after Rarity turns up with uh, missing pieces. <laughs> yeah, and there, there's that, I mean, that sort of sounds like, I mean, there's a crossover, there's black comedy, which is sort of a little different thing than horror comedy. Mm -hmm. Things like Army of Darkness and I, I'm betting uh, uh, Evil Dead, that was probably based it on. It may have been, or, right. or uh, Brain Dead. Or yeah, right. and that, that horror comedy thing, because horror is hard to take seriously. Some people can't take horror seriously, but a lot of times in modern stuff, like Shaun of the Dead is a great example. It's a horror movie with comedy in it. Zombieland is another great one, I think, for that. Um, and so there's, those aren't necessarily black comedies. Black comedies tend to be stuff that is truly tragic, not stuff where it's over the top and absurd enough. That, like someone that's dying of cancer, but still there's a comedy element to it or something. Uh, Breaking or Bad. You know, there's, a, there's several good ones about funerals and stuff. Um, so there's a slight distinction there, but it is still there are dark tones, and putting comedy in with dark tones is still the same story. Uh, let's, the guy in the far back by the door actually had his hand up. I think I, I sort of want to take it back on what you said earlier about um, if you do write, you will get better. I think the key phrase there was if you accept the criticism. Yes. The I criticism will make you get better a lot faster. Yeah. But simply even just letting your spell checker remind you about how many times there's commas is still going to slightly improve something. But, but yeah. even then, I, I know it's critical. Criticism. Authors who will all go by name who have written hundreds of thousands of words, and each fic is worse than the last just because they completely blow off criticism and tell their off tell their anybody who reads it, anybody who says it's bad, to go screw themselves. And each fic just gets progressively worse. And fair enough, it, it, it is possible to just keep smashing the keyboard and not. <laughs> but writing in the sense of if you're open to the idea that not everything is your best work, I think is the thing. Even if you're not getting outside criticism, being able to look at your own work and say, where did I do this wrong? What can I improve on? If you just keep smashing the same words out, then you'll get true. Spell check doesn't improve the plot and character. No, it doesn't. It doesn't. And you go a lot faster with criticism, and it's very essential to writing. But as Stephen King says, read a lot, write a lot. That's just how you do it. You learn by osmosis by reading good stories. You're like, why? Are, why is this good? And you just analyze it with the writer's eye, and then you just write more and more, and you start emulating that. And you start coming up with your own ideas. You're like, okay, this is a formula that works. I'll add my own little thing to it, and this is my idea. I'll plug it in, see if it works, and just keep going. It's a uh, very important to uh, take any criticism, whether it's a negative, positive, constructive, you know, whatever. To heart because that's what's going to help you improve the most. Yep. If your spell check does start criticizing the plot and character, please just make it computer. Stop Skynet before it gets started. Uh, just watch. Uh, two comments. One was uh, on, on the, the improving as a writer type thing. And yes, there, there are all people here, I'm sure, that have some sort of creative outlet itch that they, they want to scratch. And so there's that. Um, and someone mentioned that. Eventually, we're all going to write. I think the flip side of that coin, and this is just to throw this out there, uh, is that some of us that don't necessarily write, because we know we're not authors, we do edit, and it goes back to that criticism thing, uh, where it, we're trying to provide good quality feedback of this didn't work or this did work, and so there, there is that if you want to become a better writer. Uh, and then the second note was on that, that black comedy type thing where you've got people that are sort of resigned. Um, and good examples of this, I think, would be like, I, and I apologize for doing this, at the end of House, uh, the, the, the series House, he fakes his own death, and Wilson, he finally shows himself up to his friend who's dying of cancer, and he says, I'm dead. How do you want to spend the last five months of your life? Uh, because, the, and so there's, there's that aspect of black comedy as well, where we can integrate comedy into the stuff that we're writing in a way that you still accept what's going on, and I think that's the point you guys are trying to make, that we accept what's going on, but at the same time, we don't have to be Yes, okay, we know that this, this character is going to die, he has terminal cancer, but at the same time, that doesn't mean that we have to be uptight about it or anything. We can accept it and move on and just go on with life. Uh, and that, I think, is more about what we need to integrate when we do black comedy. Uh, and I look, that's the kind of thing that I look for as an editor uh, when I look at that and go, these characters aren't, they're not necessarily ignoring what's going to happen, but they're accepting it and, and 
still making the best situation out of it that they can. So yeah, it's, um, I, I I think it's when they're not in, when they are. It's not that they're ignoring it. It's simply that they're no longer the emotions are not coming from their reaction. They're they're done reacting to the bad thing. Now they're going to react to the other stuff in their life. Right. It under the umbrella of all this bad stuff that we're seeing. Uh, Pico. Um, I'm curious. Uh, we were talking earlier about setting up, you know, a punchline or a type of humor, but if you're creating, like, an original character for what ends up being a series or a long story, how would you go about creating a good character that has traits that allow you to make a good comedy? There's no such thing as a character that can't be, be good for comedy in some way, shape, or form. They might be the foil. They might be the, the, they might be the straight man in a community thing. But... It, it's about what situation you put it in. If you have a very uptight character, you put them in awkward, uncomfortable situations and you build comedy on that. If you have someone that's sarcastic all the time, a sarcastic character makes sarcastic comments and you can get some humor on that. It might be someone that doesn't take anything seriously or that is accident prone. There's whatever character trait it is, you can find some way to build comedy around that, I think. Um, you guys have anything to add on that? Uh, Mod Pie is a good example. Yes. <laughs> yeah. She's, she could be replaced by a rock, more than likely. Um, but because of how the characters are reacting to the situation, the comedy is not actually through that character, but more around that character. She's the catalyst. Yeah. She's the ultimate, it's the, the straight man, as they call it in, in comedy tropes. She's like the one that does not understand comedy, doesn't realize anything funny is happening, and is just taking everything seriously and literally. And because of that, the reader gets a lot of humor out of her, or the viewer gets a lot of humor. Uh, super in the back again. What are some types of comedy you guys would like to see more of in the story? What, what are some underused comedy? <laughs> I like to see more uh, dark comedies. <laughs> There's a little bit of romance, there's some adventure, there's a, some sort of mystery there is, and there's comedy in it. I like really, I like my comedy just sprinkled through everything like a good seasoning, more so than straight up comedies. For straight up comedies, I can appreciate almost joke link fix. Like there was one, Twilight meets a, and has a one night stand, and oh, it was a bad, bad pun nice. about a piece of furniture. <laughs> and she has a, she has her favorite nightstand to, uh, to to that she gets her books on to read and stuff. But but it's only a few thousand words. So for a very short thing, I like comedies. But I would like to see more comedies sprinkled into you know the longer stories and done well, hopefully. Like because I think it makes you more emotionally attached to the characters when there's some comedy in there with the adventure and the danger and whatever else is in a good story. So to me, I think it'd be good to see more comedy liberally through more serious stories. Uh, I'd like to see more comedies. Yeah, I think like movies like Get Um uh, But also, I'd love to see a character, a character, an author, pull off a comedy like Airplane. I think I've seen it once or twice. Uh, an author pulled it off, but that's a high standard. It is a very high Airplane standard. is a pretty high standard. Can you describe maybe it? Like, maybe not like quality, but just that style of humor. That style is also harder in writing, I think. Uh, Airplane works so well as a movie, in my opinion, because there's a lot of visual humor and very quick stuff. Yeah. If you, the jokes are so fast-paced in that that they fire off and you either get them or you don't. And it's like, oh, check the radar range. Five more minutes, sir. And then they come back to something else. If you didn't laugh at that, that's fine, because we're already well past that. We're not doing a long setup that may or may not pay off. It sets up and pays off in a couple of seconds before moving on to the next. In a written story, you inevitably have to have descriptions and narrative, and if you had to actually spell out that they were looking at a microwave oven, it makes it much more obvious what the joke was. And so it's harder to pull off some of those in a, a written medium than a mm -hmm. visual medium. Difficult, No, not impossible. And I would love to see one too, because I, I, would, I would read the heck out of that. Yes, yeah, exactly. This is a slight deviation, because I can't come up with a good answer for this, but. Um, Comedy is actually really hard to write in like story form. The reason why is 
a lot of comedy, like a lot of the things that comedy depends on is uh, delivery. And, you know, that requires like, an actor, a human being to do that. And that presence is not there in a story. So it's really hard to make it work in prose. So you have to keep that in mind. And some things only work with live action. And some just don't in prose. So you've got to really know what you're doing there. Yeah, a lot of punchlines, if you say them out loud in a totally different tone of voice, they're either funny or not. You can yep. take something that is a totally normal line and if you say it in the right tone of voice, even it can become a comedy element, and that movies do that all the time. Mm -hmm. Trying to do that in a story, because if you say she said in a funny way, doesn't really cut. It. <laughs> so it's hard to you know you've got to build your characters enough to people to where people can hear their voices before you write their funny lines, so that they're hearing the funny lines in the right tone. Mm -hmm. um, back there with the crown, I think. Um, <clears throat> yeah, on the airplane style comedy, I think where a lot of people have trouble. Writing that is, is like you said, it has to do, the, the jokes pass by fast. And in writing, I think a lot of people fall prey to the temptation to make sure everybody's going to get every joke that they try, that they manage to wedge into it, and uh, that this kills the joke. Um, you have to you have to accept that not all of your readers are going to get everything that you manage to wedge in, wedge into it to do something that's fast paced and has lots of little you know kind of the equivalent of one liners. Uh, the textual equivalent of the one line is in it. Uh, you know, just passing descriptions. Um, I wrote one once where there was a passing joke. Um, Luna goes into Celestia's room. Uh, Celestia throws a glass at her that hits the wall, and Luna casually takes off the helmet that she wore it through the door and just left it at that. Uh, it's a complete throwaway line, and if you don't know what a chamfron is, then you miss it, and that's fine. Um, and there was something, what was, it? you just said, there was something I was about to say to it, but then I got in, in the middle of saying that last thing. Oh, which, the delivery aspect? Yeah, delivery, yes. Delivery is um, the thing that i found that helps with delivery is I end up writing in a very close to the uh, focus character style uh, and let, uh, let the character's voice lead into the narration uh, and just use every little trick of line breaks and and ellipses and dashes and and every little textual trick to try and build rhythm into the prose. Um, you know, there's only so much you can do, but there is some you can do to, to build rhythm and create pauses, create the beats uh, for comedy and to get the build rhythm. Yeah, pacing is important for comedy, and, yeah, especially in it. It's tricky to pull up writing because people read at different speeds and people will, even if you put the comments where you think they need to be for the pauses and beats, other people just in the reading style will skip over those and miss them and stuff. So yeah. uh, let's go to uh, here. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Okay. Oh. Yeah. Oh. How do you make the transfer from visual comedy to written comedy? Or is there a way, is there a way you can blend them together well in writing? <laughs> well, as he, as he jokingly says, I mean, that's a true thing, graphic novels, but that's sort of not quite writing, but it involves by The problem is, is that, so, so the writers pretty much put something, they tee something up for Pinkie Pie, but Pinkie Pie wouldn't be the, the character without the VA, because that she sells that so incredibly well, and Nobody who just is writing, it's like you're amputated. You don't have that, that ability to cue it up and then have her do that because she just completely knocks the thing out of the park. You're relying in that case, what you're relying on, you're still relying on voice acting. What you're relying on is that all of us reading that fan fiction have watched the show. We know that voice in our, in our head. head. In our imagination, if we watch the show enough, we, we're hearing her voice. We're hearing the, the show voice and we are reading it in her speed, in her style, and we know exactly, and if you write it well, like the way Pinkie Pie would actually say it, it's very easy for a reader to perfectly imagine exactly how that sounds. And we're very lucky as fan fiction authors that we have voice actors technically for our readers' imaginations, because they are, she already has them, so. Uh, yeah, in the, uh, you know, quite uh, So, I don't know if this question has been posed already, I wasn't here at the beginning, but I was wondering, some of the, I was just wondering if I could get from each of you the biggest don'ts uh, when you're addressing meta slash fourth ball breaking. Don't do it. Don't do it. <laughs> okay. 
something that a character could conceivably say, but it's a, clearly to anyone that is familiar with the community, it's gonna, they're going to catch the, the Star Wars reference in that There, there is yeah. something you can certainly be subtle about it, yeah. and like you said, if it works, it works, if it doesn't, it doesn't. And it depends on the attitude of the rest of the story, too. In some stories, pop culture references are just great, because especially more, more comedy-focused stuff as opposed to anything that's getting more serious, it certainly does start to throw things out of proportion. One of my favorite characters for doing that, though, is Discord. Discord, Discord, in the show, drop, he is pop culture references. Every caution he pulls out, everything he does, is almost always a fourth wall reference outside of the is sort of, you know, something the reader or the uh, viewer can get. So if you're writing Discord, you can pull it off a lot easier than if you're just having, you know, Twilight say, wow, it's over 9,000. <laughs> <laughs> That corner there, on the drink? Uh, yes. Uh, kind of 
kind of an attachment to uh, the first thing that you did with uh, what your favorite comedy tropes are? What, what are your least favorite comedy tropes? What, what are the ones that you personally don't like? I'll say for myself, I think uh, just crude humor. Uh, the the plain blue, the, the fart joke, I think is probably my least favorite thing. I think that that, and things related to that, that sort of stuff is just uh, a reference, you know, just a, it doesn't even have to necessarily be dirty, but just like it's supposed to be awkward, for awkward sake, doesn't really work well to me as comedy. I prefer slightly wittier comedy stuff. And to me, that's even slapstick with pie in the face is still several tiers above that sort of joke. So I think that's my least favorite. The forced awkward situation. Like, I don't know how many of you watched, watched the American version of The Office. Mm -hmm. uh, God's thoughts. That was funny. I know that they thought that might be funny. That was not funny. <laughs> That was that was just that's perfect. Uh, so, and they did that a lot. We're just like, oh, oh my gosh, they'll laugh because they have no other option because the situation is so awkward, it's so painful that they have no other choice but to laugh. It's like, no, that just flat out wasn't funny. I don't want to watch anymore because the situation you presented is just and it hurt. I'm going to kind of contrast this in that pretty much any any trope can be hilarious if done properly. Like, I know I like South Park and I like British humor and all that sort of stuff, but any trope can also suck if done improperly. So my least favorite tropes are just any trope that is done poorly or overdone. Because if you do the same trope over and over and over again, it can just be not funny. Sure. Uh, yeah. Um, cue mine. As earlier stated, I'm not big on the right now, that, but Gary Stews and Mary Stews are at, uh, Mary Stews are at uh, tropes, aren't they? It's a trope, yeah, it's not a comedy trope specifically, but yeah, I mean, Mary Sue is definitely a writing profile in Japan. Yes, well, yeah. kind of, yeah, we got all of it. Yeah, I mean, that's, yeah, general practicing writing, that would be one of the tropes that you try to avoid, hopefully, unless you're putting a lampshade on it, which is a comedy trope, you put a lampshade on something like, oh, this is the most Mary Sue character ever, this is totally and 100% awesome, and blah, 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 and take it to an extreme, you can take those tropes for a bad thing and turn them on their heads and do something else with them. I've seen that done right. This uh, character is like this total awesome, like Gary Stu character, he's saving all the main six from like the chain of links, and he's like, Human character, he's like got guns and all of that. And he's like, I can stop bullets, and he gets shot and dies. <laughs> it was such a big troll pick, and everything was written poorly. And I just, I just couldn't help but laugh. And I'm like, okay, that was funny. <laughs> Those are the hard ones to pull off. Is you have to keep the reader through what they think is really awful for that Shaggy Dog story ending there at the end. So it's always a good one. Uh, Question. Question. Uh, we got. Two, let's, well, both people have asked before, so we'll go that way first. Uh, yeah, um, kind of bringing it back to both the, the translation from visual humor and um, the pop culture references, kind of brought up subtlety in, in both in, in both situations is important. Uh, you know, like, if somebody wanted to make a reference, you know, voice actor reference on Discord and make a cute joke, um, it works better to describe him showing up in a Star Trek uniform than to say he showed up in a Star Trek uniform. Mm -hmm. You know, you, you want to describe he's in a red and black tunic with a little gold badge on his chest. Um, Visually, gags are better to describe visually. Yes. Than just tell him what the gag is. Yeah, tell him the references. Tell him not. Yeah, him. and it, it's the same thing, I think, with physical comedy. Um, Again, it's, it's you have to be somewhat willing to let people not get the joke. There's actually um, a really good example I am thinking of how not to do it in a professionally published piece of fiction. Um, I don't know how many folks here read Girl Genius. Uh, and they've been doing the, the novel versions of it recently, uh, full prose novel versions that they've been writing. And it's kind of felt to me like they're better at graphic novels than they are at Pros. Uh, the thing that really stuck out and just stuck in my memory uh, very early in in the section on the first trip to Castle Wolfenbach, 
there is a, or actually even before that, no, that was in, in Fiedelberg, whatever. Uh, there's a visual ge gag where one of the characters opens the closet and everything falls out on him. You know, the classic, uh, uh, we cleaned everything by stuffing it in the closet gag. And uh, it's crowned off in the graphic novel by him catching the full goldfish bowl that fell out of the closet. And in the novel, they were so married to getting that visual gag into the novel that they spent a whole paragraph on the goldfish bowl. And it, it, it dragged. It dragged. And it wasn't funny by the time they got to the goldfish bowl. And that, that's going to be what we were talking about with pacing earlier and stuff. Uh, in sight gags, of course, the hardest to translate the writing. The picture's worth a thousand words, they say. Well, a thousand words really messes up the pacing of the show. So some sight gags may just not work. Or if, even if you can make them work, they may not be worth the effort, and they may take people out of your story if you spend too much time setting up what you were just saying. So the problem with it was that I could see immediately how they could have cut and, and, and had it in there, but they were too married to making sure that everybody got the joke. And if yep. they cut it down to one throwaway line, some people would, have, would not have noticed it. So that they hammered it, hammered it down. Definitely helps when you have editors to help you narrow it down and say whether or not they got the joke when you yes. get your short version. You think they get the joke in the shortest form possible, that's the best. So having people you can you know read against and stuff helps. Uh, My tip for the joke thing is you want to have just like some fix, you know, they rely on a, f a few key jokes. You have to make sure people get those jokes and those jokes work. And then on the way to them, you can just sprinkle as many little jokes that don't interfere with the story as possible. And if they get them, great. If not, fine. Like, that's what I do sometimes. Like, oh, I wonder who will get this. And then I just, when I post the story, I'm like, I, I, look, at, I look for comments saying, oh, will, will they quote this? And which jokes will I have written that aren't quoted at all? And just a little fun mini game I have for myself. And then you find out that they found a joke in there you didn't even mean to write. Like, oh, that is a bad pun that I put in there. I didn't know this. Oh, no, it's <laughs> don't get me started on bad puns. <laughs> <laughs> I'm the king of bad puns. Well, all the time that happens. But all right. as, as you say, you witty some, you some. Yep. We've got a couple minutes left. Uh, let's, uh, any final questions? Let's see. Um, OK, we will have you guys one, you guys one. Um, you, you have an ass one, right? So yeah, I'll let you. Um, what about like this guy? <laughs> he was doing a great deadpan earlier. Um, I think it is also a tricky one to pull off because if you've set up the premise and the characters are established or the setting or whatever it is, when a character delivers a deadpan and the reader's in the right mindset, it's going to work great. It's hard to set up though because a lot of people can easily misinterpret it if they don't fully get the full setup that the character just saying something that sounds a little out of place but what, and they're not realizing that it's meant to be read deadpan. When an actor delivers it deadpan, it's clear, oh, there's supposed to be a joke I'm getting here because usually there's a great tonal change of voice and stuff. This is different. Versus normal conversation. It's, it's harder to do in writing, but it's about the setup and lining things up so that your character's well established in advance. Yeah. And then it's clear that the tone of voice and the way they're saying it, it's out of place with the rest of their conversation, so it's clear they somehow stand for the as they get in. You really have to know the vernacular, just add the vernacular down. <coughs> Stephen Wright, sure. Stephen Wright is probably the best deck and comedian ever. Um, and then the joke of his is, he came up to me and said, if someone told someone asked you, uh, would you like to know how and when you were going to die, would you take him up on it? And I said, no, and she said, forget it then. <laughs> what was that? What was the punchline of the whole thing? Punchline. Forget it then. Uh. <laughs> so if you're going to do like that in writing, you might have you know, the character sitting down, like someone sitting, so describe someone sitting next to him, just like a blank expression on the face. The very minimalistic body language. Uh, maybe not making eye contact, uh, maybe speaking quietly, that kind of thing. Just setting up what they're looking like, how they're speaking, and that'll get across to the uh, readers. You know, okay, I can kind of get. When you're doing deadpan with sarcasm, sometimes you can actually use the dialogue tag, she deadpan, 
when the character is obviously trying to like, you know, latch in themselves, when they're not just deadpanning subtly, when they're actually going like, oh really, or something like that, or uh huh, uh huh. And it's supposed to be clear that the, the character themselves is trying to get it across the other characters, but they're doing a dead hand. You know, I, think, I think say dead hand. If you're doing something that's actually meant to be a joke that's more subtle, saying that directly is pointing out the joke, so it may not work in this case. All right, I think uh, we are just about done here, so it is uh, time to uh, wrap up. I want to thank uh, all our panelists for coming, Marie Markson. <laughs>